Um, I think you'll enjoy Dan, and I will move over to Dan. Right. <coughs> All right. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Um, what's been the most fun thing that you've uh, learned throughout this process? Any volunteers? What's what's stuck? That there's millions of different types of leaders, and they have a bunch of different traits. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Most memorable speaker so far? I mean, that's a last year today. <laughs> the mayor. Mayor? Good. Anybody else have a favorite? Anybody else? All right, so uh, Dan Wright, Executive Director of Strategy for Accutech. Uh, as Rob said, um, Accutech has is, is, is kind of morphed since I joined the company. Uh, when I joined the company six years ago, uh, it was a company that focused on financial technology uh, for banks. Kind of the easy way that I've explained what we do uh, there is, I say if you, if you see a bank, with the name First Bank and Trust, we make the software that the and trust part of the bank runs on. So that software is highly complex, enterprise level software that does everything from portfolio management and trading to regulatory compliance for the banks. So just there's a ton in that software. And that's historically what the company has done. Uh, since uh, I joined, uh, the company, the Accutech Systems Corp, has really kind of morphed into a holding company with a number of different business units underneath. Um, so we made our first corporate acquisition in 2019. We acquired a, a company that writes uh, software for financial advisors to use to make financial plans for their clients. So it's a financial planning software company. Um, we've started our own uh, couple of things, new products that we've launched into either the bank space or in the advisor space. Um, and then about three years ago, um, we were able to lean into our owner's vision for what he wanted to do for the community. So our, our current owner is a second generation owner of the company. He took over from his parents' uh, leadership of the company in 2010. And then he bought out his parents from, uh, became owner of the company in 2012. So the first several years, that he owned and operated the company, he put all of the profit right back into the company to grow it. Um, and it really wasn't until, again, about three years ago that we had the resources to begin to fulfill what he wanted to do for the community. Um, and that has led to now having uh, three different businesses in the community. So we have, uh, we own uh, Vera May's restaurant downtown. Uh, we started what's called the Clubhouse. Um, uh, downtown as well, so if you like the golf, um, uh, come down and see us at the clubhouse, rent a, a digital golf bay for a little bit and have some uh, drinks and food. Um, also have a really cool bay that does all kinds of other sports as well. Um, and you can play uh, zombie dodgeball uh, if you want, <laughs> or uh, some really fun shooting games. Uh, so anyway, come down and see us at the clubhouse. Uh, and then we also bought two local marketing and ad agencies that we combined together um, into one uh, to serve not only uh, the sort of businesses, nonprofits in this community and in this area, but also to begin to serve the banks and the financial advising firms that we, we have on our financial technology side. Just a little bit about Accutech. My role um, is, the, I, I say the fun part of my job is I, I try to help the organization kind of look out into the future uh, and develop a roadmap of products and services uh, for our organization. But I have, uh, I wear a number of hats, so uh, finance, HR, marketing, product management, administration, that, those are some of the areas that, uh, that I'm responsible for. I wanna share a little bit about my journey. How did, how, how did we get here? Um, things that I've learned along the way in different parts of the journey. Um, that I hope you'll be able to, uh, uh, to take away. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about an approach to leadership 
that I'm sort of piloting myself for the first time this year. And a, a kind of a tool that I'm, I'm developing to do that. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll talk about shepherd leadership at the end. Um, but we'll just start a little bit about my background and my journey. So I was uh, born to missionary parents in the Philippines um, who then moved to the States, um, actually up the road in Marion, when I was seven years old. So I grew up in that environment, in that, that home. Um, I did not take a particularly traditional path um, early on. Uh, so um, I was married at 19. I uh, got married halfway through my sophomore year of college. Uh, finished the sophomore year of college and dropped out. Um, a year later, had our first son. Um, worked multiple part-time jobs to make ends meet. Uh, because I was working part-time jobs, um, we didn't have any insurance when my, my son was born. Um, and as you might imagine, that presented some challenges for us. And it took a while for me personally to just get to the place of saying, Dan, what, am, what are you going to do differently? What, where are you headed? And what are you going to do differently to, to make a, a change? So um, I started back in school. I had found a job. Actually, I started working at Marion General Hospital when I was a senior in high school through a program that educated uh, students about different health occupations. And so I started this job as a phlebotomist, drawing blood in the lab at the hospital. And uh, over those then early years, I, I was able to turn that into a full-time job uh, at the hospital. <coughs> and then, uh, so the lab has several different areas or departments in it. Uh, and I was able to move into a laboratory uh, technology uh, position uh, in the pathology department. Anybody know what a pathology department does? They're the, they're the department that gets all of the stuff that comes out of you during surgery to test for like cancer or other kinds of diseases. That was an interesting period. I got to help with autopsies. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a very different uh, sort of world. And I thought laboratory stuff was gonna be my thing. I actually enjoyed that world a lot. So when I went back to school to finish my degree, I went for a biology degree. And so it, it took me eight years to finish my bachelor's. Um, got my bachelor's and so at that point I had two kids. Uh, and I felt like if I, I knew that I wanted to do more um, and I really thought I, I should add the MBA uh, for my goals. Um, and I knew that when I finished my bachelor's, I thought if I stop at all now, I'm probably never going to go back. So I graduated in December, January, started my MBA. So it took the next two years to finish that. While I was in my MBA program, so let me tell you the couple things I learned early on. <coughs> and the, probably the best advice that I received in those really early years of, of just working in the lab and trying to figure out life. But when I got that full-time job, uh, a friend of mine said, Dan, remember? Your job is to make your boss look like a rock star for hiring you. So uh, make your boss look like a rock star for hiring you and help your boss succeed. You do those two things, you'll move forward. Never forgot them. Um, and so true. Um, and that helped and that worked. Um, so, uh, Here's, here's the thing to take away from that. If you are, aspire to be a leader, the reality is the first, you're not gonna be a leader out of the gate, most likely, right? You're not gonna be in a management position or supervisory position out of college. You're gonna be in a position where you have to contribute uh, as an individual contributor, right? So your, the first thing you gotta do is understand you've gotta perform really, really well as an individual contributor. Again, part of that, going back to helping your boss succeed, 
making your boss look like a rock star for hiring you. If you do those things and you succeed as an individual contributor, you set yourself up for the next step, right? And that's exactly the way it worked for me. So because I had done that, I was able to move into the like lab tech role and then I got promoted to supervisor of that part of the laboratory. Um, and I was, I was still ambitious enough, young enough, I had no idea what that meant really when I took the job. Uh, and uh, got a quick <laughs> education in making that switch from being a, uh, an individual contributor to um, a manager, supervisor. I probably made every mistake a rookie supervisor can make. Um, but you know, when you, <coughs> that happens to you, and hopefully it does, hopefully you, you grow to a position where you're, you're in a, a, a role with more responsibility. Oftentimes what happens is you work with a group and then you become manager of a group. What do you, what do you think are the main things you're gonna face in those situations? Challenges. Um, struggling to get them to actually see you as management and not just a teammate. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. You get earned respect. Um, getting people to like buy into like your vision and what you see. Yeah. One well, of the biggest struggles that happens in that situation is is uh, as an individual teammate, we're buddies, right? And now that's changed. And that can be really awkward. So uh, now you have to tell somebody that was formerly just your buddy uh, that they screwed up or they need to improve in a particular area. Um, and uh, navigating that can be challenging. Um, but Here's one of the things I learned through that process is um, setting an expectation at the start is so absolutely key. So one of the other things I learned, you learn about moving from individual contributor to a supervisor is that you have to learn a whole new set of skills. So as an individual contributor, you succeeded by getting really good at doing this, whatever job it is you've got to do, right? Um, and, and so when you move to a leadership position, it's a whole different set of skills that you have to then commit yourself to learning. Um, so I did not fully appreciate that in my first, uh, when I was first promoted uh, as a supervisor, but you do learn it along the way. Uh, one of the things I probably would have done differently or would do differently if I would go back now is uh, setting those expectations with people that had been my buddies of, um, you know, I think it's possible to be friends with your, with your boss. I do. But there's, you have to be able to, to say when we're at work, when we're doing work, this is how we're going to approach the relationship. Um, and uh, setting so some framework around that of expectations for both is really important. Um, Conflict management. Now, being leadership, uh, <coughs> this is something they don't prepare you for very well, I don't think. Um, I remember the first time I had to literally get in between two lab techs in my department who were about ready to fight. <laughs> um, the conversation had gotten <coughs> so heated uh, between them um, that I literally had to physically get in between to go to corners. Um, so uh, I've probably had to do that, um, fortunately not a ton, because I work primarily in sort of professional work settings, but I've had to do that at least three times that I can remember. Um, so <laughs> Understanding how to do that, how to do that well, without losing your own cool in the process, uh, 
I admit that probably the first time or two, I did not <laughs> navigate that probably as effectively as I could. But again, when you move that uh, from that individual contributor to the, the leader role, you, you are committing yourself to learning a whole new set of skills. And that's, that aren't necessarily easy. It's not as, as easy as some of the individual contributor stuff where you're just you're doing things, right? The other thing that you understand when you move into that role is it's still about getting stuff done. You just have to get stuff done through other people, right? So uh, you still have to make progress. You still have to produce output, but now you're doing it with and through others, not just yourself. And that's a hard switch for a lot of people to make. Um, and I, I see it even now, uh, where someone that we've promoted still wants to do things herself. Because she not, is not to the point where she wants to let go of those things to the team to do for her. So that's a real struggle. Uh, and you gotta, again, it's just awareness of when you make that switch, you're committing to learn a whole new set of skills. Uh, so then I got to, I made two fairly significant <coughs> left turns uh, in my career. Uh, so I was in my MBA program, I'm supervising this uh, area of the lab, and um, in that world, the IT space, the technology and system space, was uh, kind of grew up really around the finance part of the hospital. So patient accounting and patient records and those kinds of things were some of the first things to be automated. And uh, the, the systems were beginning to get applied into the clinical parts of the hospital. And the lab was like the first uh, clinical department to be automated because the lab has lots of instruments that produce data that could be gathered and set in reporting and that kind of thing, right? So, young, in my MBA program, uh, I was the only one that kind of raised my hand to learn about this and to work with our IT department to put in the, the first laboratory information system at Mary John Hospital. Um, and I loved it. I had a lot of fun. Um, so I became the system administrator, you know, for the, for the IT system. And I got introduced to the IT world. And uh, within about six weeks of completing that project, the chief information officer at the hospital said, I want you to come to work in my department. And I want you to help other clinical areas of the hospital put in systems. All right, degree in biology, but lab stuff was going to be it for me. I enjoyed it. I liked it. But there was this other thing, too, that I liked, that I found, which on the system side, the IT side. So I was trying to make that decision. And uh, my friends in the lab um, were like, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go over there. Like, why? Well, you know who that reports to, right? Yeah, CFO of the hospital. Uh, is over IT, um, you do realize he's the hardest guy to work for in this whole place. Like, okay, why, how? So the CFO had been known as kind of this, the tough guy of the hospital, right? Uh, fairly demanding, um, um, yeah, difficult to work for. So I had folks saying, you, you, don't, want to do, you don't want to go over there. Fortunately, I did not listen to them, um, and I took the job. Uh, so I was the first systems analyst uh, in the IT department at Marion General. Uh, within about eight months, the chief information officer uh, resigned and left, and uh, I raised my hand to take his place and report directly to the CFO. Um, and so a couple of things I learned in that process. When you're making those kinds of career moves, expect to have to do the job for a while before you get the title and the pay. At least that's the way it worked for me. And you know, looking back, I don't, I don't blame the CFO at all for kind of putting me through that. 
because again, I'm I'm still a pretty young guy that uh, is has just joined the IT department, uh, and uh, I haven't necessarily had a huge track record yet. So of course, uh, looking back, uh, he said, "Okay, I'm going to give you the interim <coughs> title. We'll see how you do." And I had to do that job for several months uh, before getting the title um, and getting the raise. So if that happens to you, trust me, it's, it's kind of the way that it often works. Uh, you're not automatically going to get the title and the raise uh, without having to prove yourself uh, in a particular role. What I learned about that CFO, I loved working for him. And the reason I, I loved working for him Yes, he was, he, was, uh, he was demanding is probably not quite the right word. He had high expectations for what we were going to accomplish. But he made those expectations super, super clear. Um, so I, there was no ambiguity with what the measure of success would be. Um, and I loved that about him. And that's one of the things that I learned from him in that process was how helpful setting clear expectations for people who work for you really is. Um, and that's something I've carried with me since then. Then I've probably made the <coughs> dumbest, worst mistake, whatever, um, decision. Uh, because at, at the hospital at Mary General, the uh, that role of head of IT was not a cabinet level role. And that's what I was aspiring for. Um, and the chief information officer role at that time had been starting to be elevated uh, in many organizations to be a cabinet level role. And uh, so I decided to leave Mary General uh, and look <coughs> a place that I could, I could go that would be CIO and be in the cabinet. Um, I got a job that fit uh, what I was looking for, and I hated it. Um, not because of the role or uh, you know what I was doing. The culture of where I went was was not good. And so here's here's a takeaway for you from that process. I, well, what did, what did I learn? <laughs> uh, do a really good job of interviewing your interviewer. When you interview for a job, um, and it's probably going to be the manager of that area, somebody you're going to report to, you're going to end up interviewing with that individual. Do a really good job of interviewing the interviewer as best you can. Uh, I know that's kind of hard sometimes, but I think if I had learned a little bit more I might have been tipped off to some culture things that I, I found out by, you know, actually going to work. Um, and I might have waved off that particular opportunity. Um, fortunately, I was working on a project uh, that ended up with um, a, about a year later, uh, I jumped off the entrepreneurial cliff. Um, and started a custom software development company uh, in Marion with a partner. Uh, so I, I was kind of uh, the, the business side of the house. He was a super advanced uh, uh, programmer, technical expert. Um, and we got a contract with Indiana Western University uh, to build out some uh, custom technology for them for a project they were doing that was uh, funded by a grant from Eli Lilly. And we said, okay, we're gonna go do this. Um, and one of the things that you're gonna have to understand is you are always gonna be learning. If you're gonna succeed and keep moving forward and doing new things, you are, you are always going to be learning. So I went from kind of understanding how to set strategy, um, how, to, how to create processes for uh, for effectiveness, uh, interact with technology companies, interact with uh, and be the mediator between 
users and vendors to now running a business. And by the way, uh, I still had, I was married, two kids, still had to support my family as well, right? Um, so uh, just jumping into business uh, was scary, fun, exciting, bottom line, if you have a chance to do it, to take away from me, if I had to do it again, I would. If you get a chance, take it. But understand, there's, it's probably the hardest thing you're ever gonna do. Um, what, so what ended up happening was, we grew the company. We actually uh, had, uh, had achieved some success. We ended up with about uh, 38 employees, most of them uh, software developers, uh, that we had uh, uh, working on a number of different projects. And uh, until our largest client decided to pull out of a project. Um, so December 6, 2006, was probably the worst day of my professional career. Because I had to go tell about 20 people that I had come to know and love uh, that they didn't have a paycheck anymore. Um, and I had to lay them off. There are tough days in business if you're a business owner. That was one of them. That was the worst for me. And a testament to the, I think, the culture that we've been able to build was, it was December 6th, remember the timing. Um, we had planned a, a Christmas party for the team, like the next Saturday, and they all still wanted to do it. Um, so we still had our Christmas party, uh, and we enjoyed that time together, um, but that was, a, that was a rough December. Um, and I remember after that thinking, are we going to survive? Are we going to make it? Uh, so I put company payroll on personal credit cards, um, probably longer than I should have. It's hard. You want to run a business, start your own thing. It's exciting. Like I said, I would do it over again. I would make that decision again. But just understand what you're in for, right? It's going to be work. There's going to be personal sacrifice involved. Um, the way that story ended was good. We did turn the company around again, kept growing again um, until the place where we could actually we sold the company uh, to a buyer who wanted to acquire. Uh, a set of products that we had created um, in the last uh, two or three years that, uh, that we owned the company. Um, that was an amazing learning experience. Uh, I went to work for the company that uh, acquired us and uh, that company imploded. Um, so they were in a particular direction. Uh, and had put a lot, well, 98% of their eggs in a particular basket that didn't work out. Um, so two years later, I'm like, okay, now what? Um, where do I go next? Uh, next left turn, higher education, Dr. Rob. So, uh, I was to the point of saying, okay, man, I've, I've been working really hard for a buck all my life. Um, I don't, I don't want to chase that anymore. Uh, I want something that will fulfill kind of a different part of my, my soul. Um, and I didn't know what that was. Uh, until I got introduced to a small uh, Christian college in downtown Newark, New Jersey. Um, who needed a new, uh, was looking for a new CFO, an executive VP. And I get, I, my brother's actually the one that introduced me uh, to them. And I was like, really? Uh, hire a downtown Newark, New Jersey? And that's really what I'm gonna go do? Um, and he said, no, I, th I, think, I think you would love it. Go have the conversation. So I did. Moved to New Jersey for six years. 
absolutely loved it. Uh, loved the college. It was a very non-traditional college. So this was a minority-based uh, adult college. So 90% of the student body was uh, minority, and average age was 37. So these were people that had kind of gotten out of the, the Newark public school system, uh, never gone to college, but had come to the point of realizing something had to change in order to change the, their trajectory in life. Guess who resonated with that story, right? Um, and so we engaged there. Uh, I worked for a very non-traditional college president, um, very entrepreneurial, uh, thought was always thinking about new ways to serve students. Um, and he ended up putting me in the provost role over academics. I'm like, <laughs> what do I know about academics, right? I had taught before, um, but up for the <coughs> challenge. So uh, I uh, led their academic world. I started their first uh, graduate programs. Um, long story short, really enjoyed our time there. Uh, and it was very fulfilling because as you might imagine, graduations were a little different there. There were celebrations of a different sort um, and unbelievably satisfying from the standpoint of really helping people make change in their life and, and help, help them move forward in tangible ways. We have grandkids. Um, by the way, I have a, an amazing life partner. Um, my wife uh, has been a steady uh, support and help and partner for me. Um, we've been married, uh, we just celebrated 41 years of uh, marriage. And uh, she is just not leadership, but uh, just choose wisely when you get to that point because <laughs> uh, it really makes a difference. It's, uh, uh, it's helpful. Um, and I credit her and, and my foundation of faith uh, as really the, the things that uh, um, have, uh, have been consistently what I come back to over and over again throughout changing careers and positions in life. We have grandkids, six grandkids that all live in the Midwest. Five years of not having any grandkids in her house, my wife was like, this is not going to work. Um, so uh, that's when we kind of made the change and came back here, uh, found Architect, was introduced to Architect through a friend, uh, and have been there. Um, let's see if I missed any of the lesson stuff that I wanted to share. Um, one of the things I, I learned, oh, uh, I was talking about the, you know, run my own business and the, the highs and lows of, of that. Just understand that the higher you go in leadership, um, the more problem, more challenging the problems are that you get to solve. So one of the things you have to commit yourself to uh, if you want to advance in leadership is, is be a really good problem solver. Because if you think about it, uh, you know, the the things that are going to land on your plate from somebody else in terms of their challenges is something they can't solve. So uh, just remember the, the higher you go, the better the problem solver you're going to commit yourself to be. Um, in the higher ed world, one of the things that came to mind was that very first advice that I got was still applicable. So the idea of helping your boss succeed uh, works in no matter what level you're at. And I would say that that's still a key part of what I think about every day, uh, even in the role I'm in today, is how can I help our leader accomplish the goals he has for our organization? Um, if you keep that kind of focus in mind with whoever you work with, um, it's, it just puts you together in a different way with your leader to go accomplish stuff. Um, and that leader sees it and knows it when it's genuine and rewards it. 
right? So that's one of the, the takeaways of my time out in New Jersey. So it brings me to Accutech. Um, by the way, we're going to hire Ed, a uh, figure, I thought I was going to stay there for a while. So um, I started my PhD, pro uh, PhD program um, and moved to Muncie right when I entered dissertation phase, uh, which was challenging because quite honestly, learning the job, learning the industry that we're in uh, at Accutech, it was like, here we go again. I gotta learn a whole new thing. Um, and I, it took me probably a year to get back on the dissertation, and I just, again, came to the point of saying, number one, I'm not gonna waste all the money I just spent. Um, number two, I wanna finish what I started. And uh, so I, I was able to finish that. Um, and then, as uh, Dr. Rob mentioned, Axtec has grown. Uh, we had a new business unit, new different kinds of businesses. So now it's not technology, just technology anymore. We got restaurants, we got other kinds of stuff going on. Um, you're always going to be learning uh, if you're moving forward. It's just the way it works. Um, so I studied leadership uh, for my doctorate. There's a whole, uh, studying it and doing it right are two different things. Um, I am trying something new this year uh, that I'll share with you. And I have found to be kind of a helpful framework um, <laughs> that lets me be more intentional about how I'm doing leadership. And this really came out, um, I told you by background, born to missionary parents, uh, I've been in the church all my life, um, and I was thinking about the idea of servant leadership is kind of, you know, where I've, I've been most of my life. Um, but I've, if I look in the in the scripture, there's this repeating pattern of uh, of <coughs> Christ as a shepherd, and there's different sort of examples of shepherds being kind of highlighted in scripture. And so this idea of uh, good shepherd leadership is what I'm, what I'm working on. So, and I think these, uh, these four things are applicable no matter what sort of faith perspective you come from, um, or if you come from no faith perspective. I think there's still really good solid principles to lead from. But if I'm so looking at that idea of, uh, of good shepherd leadership, found four things that a good shepherd does really well. First thing is the shepherd knows his sheep. Second is the shepherd feeds his sheep. Third is the shepherd protects his sheep. And the fourth is the shepherd leads his sheep. So I wrote out some ideas of what each one of those kind of entail, entails. But maybe you can, maybe I can learn from you. What, to, to you, what would it mean to know the people that you work with? Know your sheep, what, what would that mean? Know what they value, what they need, what they like expect from you. Just where they're headed. Yeah, absolutely. Know a little bit about the personal life. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I know previously <coughs> in our talks, uh, they said that the best kind of a leader is the one that puts their ear to the ground mm. and listens to what they need. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. So I created a, a template. I just started with the basics. Um, so, you know, birthday, uh, am I, am I seeing that coming? Am I going to say something? Uh, are they married? Not kids, not, uh, dog, cat, uh, favorite food. I mean, just, so the first part of what I created was just this idea of just knowing the a little bit about the person. And then, 
Um, we use a tool uh, at Acutech called the Culture Index. And uh, you, I hear you guys have been taking certain kinds of assessments, right? Um, by the way, the first, first thing you gotta do uh, before you can lead others is you gotta know yourself. You gotta lead yourself. So knowing yourself is absolutely crit critical to leading well. Um, but we use this tool called Culture Index, and it helps us understand um, some of the things you were talking about. Like, uh, not all of us are motivated by the same kinds of things, and not all of us receive praise or want to receive praise in the same kinds of ways. There are some people that are wired to, if you thank them, praise them in front of others, that's great. There are people who do just feel like this when you do that, right? They, they, they don't want that attention. How do you know? So um, we can use these tools to our advantage in just knowing our people and what motivates them, what helps them. Um, and then yes, obviously where, where you wanna go in your career, where are you headed? How can I, how can I set you up for success, both here uh, and in the future? So yeah, good stuff around, know your sheep. What do you think feeding the sheep means like, or means? I say like feeding their brains, like giving them other opportunities on top of it, like training programs and rooms for them to grow personally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe like saying like, you know, you're doing a good job, you're doing great here, just making sure they know they're Number one thing I wrote down is uh, how, do I, how do I thank this person? To recognize them, right? Just making sure their needs are met. Yeah. Incentives and rewards. Right, so I mean, you can think of just the basics of wage and cop too, right? Bonuses and other kinds of things. And then, um, and again, no, knowing what motivates people is, is really important because some kinds of recognition uh, actually are more valuable than just dollars um, in terms of feeding a person's soul. Any other ideas on feeding sheep? Let's put basic equipment and yeah. things like that, just Good. software. Yeah, do they have the tools do they need to succeed? Sure. Giving honest feedback, even if they don't like it. Everything I've learned about leadership, I've probably <coughs> learned by being a parent. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, you're, you're gonna give your kids honest feedback because you want them to succeed. You want them to avoid pitfalls, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah? Protect your sheep. What does that mean? Um, so, like, say it's like, I work retail. So if, like, you have a customer come up and be like, you know, I understand, like, <coughs> they probably weren't the best that they should have been. You're not in trouble or anything. Like, I just had to say what I had to say. So just making sure, like, they're emotionally taken care of if something happens. And also, like, what you did when you did the credit card, like making sure they still got the pay that they deserved and making sure that you're taking care of their needs. Yeah, yeah. Having a sense of loyalty to them. Hmm. Hmm. I'll back that a little bit more for, for me. What, what are you thinking? Well, if they, if, if you give them your trust, yeah, you put trust in them and allow them to make mistakes as they go along the way and just be there to help them up. You know, like, like with your companion, your wife, having loyalty to someone. Yeah. I mean, it's a different kind of loyalty, but the loyalty that, hey, I've got your back. Yeah. Because I know you've got mine. I got your back. That's, a, that's a, uh, one of the things, the concepts I wrote down for myself around the idea of protecting. Um, I, I thought of it this way. It's like, again, back to kids. Um, we teach them stuff early on, right? Look both ways before we cross the road. Don't touch a hot stove. There, if we know things in an organization where if we know where the potholes are and we don't tell our people where they are, we're not protecting them, right? Um, so helping them understand uh, uh, where, you know, how to protect themselves even in the organization is a big part of it. And as leaders, that's one of the things that sometimes uh, I have to be really intentional about is that I'll know things because of conversations that I'm in across the organization. And um, some, somebody under me 
may not have the same perspective or understand what else is going on. And if I don't really communicate that well, they can get themselves in trouble. And I want to avoid that. That's part of me protecting uh, the sheep, if that makes sense. And then lead the sheep. Um, obviously, leadership is a huge subject. But um, when I think about leading, just the very first things that come to mind is, am I helping them prioritize uh, so that they are focused on the most important things, getting most important things done? Am I, uh, to an earlier point here, am I giving them opportunities that uh, uh, to both succeed and fail, by the way, um, where uh, they get to grow um, as individuals? So management and leadership, we've got to do both really well. Um, but they're different targets for, for what our behaviors or actions are driving for. When we manage, we're really, again, we're about getting the work done. Um, and when we lead, we're about developing the people to get it done. Uh, so the leadership is all about, am I giving them opportunity? Um, am I giving them appropriate amounts of direction? If it's something brand new that they've never done before that I'm asking them to do, am I helping them by giving enough direction up front that they have what they need to succeed? So there's a you know, there's a whole set of activities or behaviors in the lead part. Um, so again, I'm trialing this this year. My first chance to, to really try to put this into practice. And I've just found that at least so far, it's helped me be super intentional about certain leadership behaviors. Um, you, you'll find what works for you. I would suggest um, not waiting until you're my age to figure that out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we learn, learn along the way. Uh, figure out what helps you, what tools helps you. Um, just going back to the, the beginning, and I'll wrap up now. Um, you're probably not going to be in that position on day one. So perform really well as an individual contributor. Help your boss succeed. We'll start you on your journey uh, really well. I would also say one of the interesting pieces of advice that I got when I was in my first supervisory position at the hospital is um, my boss said, Dan, you should, uh, I love golf. I played high school golf, um, but my, my head was in a completely different place then because I was going to school, I had a family, first supervisory position. My boss says, Dan, join the hospital summer golf league and play in the league. I'm like, okay, why? Um, he said, you will be rubbing shoulders with other people across this organization that you need to network with. And that's a great way to do it. So another thing that you might want to keep in mind as you enter the work world is how do you get exposure uh, to others in the organization um, that might help you advance your career? Uh, find a mentor, all of those kinds of things. Um, I know we're in a, a world these days where we have so many jobs that are remote, and a lot of people want think that's the greatest thing ever. I can just I can work from anywhere. I can work, work remote. Um, one of the things that I would caution you is that that often removes you from the ability to network with others in the organization because it becomes really siloed. So just keep that in mind when you're, you're thinking about the positions that you want to take. Uh, and look for ones that will expose you to more that's going on across the organization. All right, I'm done. <laughs> more questions? Yeah. So I would assume you're around like 60 is based on like the number that you gave. You did math. <laughs> so like timeline wise, what was like the timeline for like age in your career? Yeah, so I got that first supervisor job was probably 28. <laughs> Um, at that point. Uh, and then the chief informationer, chief information officer job, um, I was probably 33. Um, when I was, uh, you know, my career in IT, I think I was 38 when I started the business. Um, yeah. To remember all the milestones. Does that help? Yeah. 
So you said you went, <clears throat> sorry. So you said you went into a lot of roles, like where you didn't have experience. Yeah. So how did you like meet people when they came to you with a question that you really didn't know the answer to? Um, so, uh, great question. Sometimes I couldn't, right? Um, but leading people is kind of the same no matter what job others have. Um, so it's more along the lines of, um, there's a concept called situational leadership. Um, you have to kind of know where somebody is and their understanding of a particular area. So a lot of times, um, it's helping that individual discover the answer. If, I, if I'm not the subject matter expert, how, you have to get really good at asking questions that, that help somebody kind of work through something and come to an answer uh, on, on their own. Also, you have to be resourceful enough to know where to find the experts when they're needed and bring them into the conversation. Anybody else? What was the worst like experience you've had working so far, <coughs> like in your whole career? Uh, the day I had to lay off my friends, that was definitely the, the hardest day. Um, I think the, uh, um, some of the more, more challenging situations too is, uh, <coughs> are, would have been around managing perceptions up and down. So I've been in situations where my leader had a really bad view of someone else in my team. And so trying to manage those things have been challenging parts uh, of my career. I can also tell you that one of the worst parts of being, again, the higher up you go, one of the worst parts of that is you make decisions and you have to defend decisions for which you cannot tell publicly why they're made that way. Um, and uh, so we've all said, it. I have no idea what they were thinking, right? Well, the reality is leaders are often privy to information that can't be shared, that if we knew it, we'd kind of understand why they decided something the way it was. So there have been times where I've had to um, be okay with people <laughs> thinking I'm, I'm an idiot. Um, and it's just the way it is. And, and you really can't say anything about it. But that's, again, that's part of our that responsibility. And those last two things are protecting people. Yes, absolutely. You talked about like interviewing your interviewer when you like apply to companies. What are some things you can ask to get a good like feeling of the company culture, like just through an interview? Yeah, um, the, the ch most challenging thing is getting them to actually be honest with you. Um, but, you know, you can start with the basics. Tell me what it's like to, to work in your department. Um, tell me a little bit about your own leadership style. Are you more hands-on? Are you hands-off? Uh, what can I expect from you in the first six months that, that we work together? Um, what's your onboarding process look like? Uh, so, uh, and then if they'll answer, you can ask, like, what's been the most frustrating thing you've had to deal with with somebody on your team? They probably won't answer it completely. But you're trying to get a, a view into what, what triggers they have um, and what's important to them. Hope this has been helpful, folks. Did take away something? All right. So this, uh, this model of... Um, so knowing, feeding, protecting, and leading. Give Dan some feedback on, we just looked at the, the 12 elements of a great leader again, uh, Tuesday, right? So give him some feedback on this stuff. Like this is, this is a shrunk down model, right? What do you think? You're the expert now. What do you think? Don't be shy. Um, I think it all makes sense. Like it, it makes sense when you look at it and you're thinking about how you want to be led. Just 
because like we haven't been in like well, most of us probably haven't been in like a actual like management perspective and having to manage people. But when you're being managed, you kind of know what you want from somebody, what you would expect them to be like. Mm -hmm. So it would like if I had a manager who was like this, I would be happy. Cool. I mean, I was thinking about the checklist, and I'm like, did, did we check all 12 of those items when Dan was talking? I think so. Any other questions? <coughs> no? Well, you are ready for spring break. <laughs> Last call. You know this well, right? You have, yep. to be, you have to be okay with silence. Because <laughs> there's somebody that wants to ask a question <laughs> and they're getting the courage up to ask it. No? All right. Have a good break. Thank you all.